Good morning. I don't want to break up this uh, gentle buzz of conversation. Thank you very much indeed for coming. I'm Bronwyn Maddox. I'm director of the Institute for Government, and we're delighted to be launching this report today. The 2019 spending review, how to run it well, we've said with some directness. We're delighted that Martin Wheatley joined us as senior fellow to work on this, which is the first of several reports the Institute is doing on the Treasury and on the management of public spending. And I've been working on it with him too, and also with Tess Kidney, Bishop of our research team. Tess, would you like to uh, stand up? And uh, in much discussion with many of you and people at the Treasury too. I'm delighted to have as well this morning, James Bowler, Director General of Public Spending in the Treasury to talk about it and Simon Parker, uh, way back of this parish, but now uh, di uh, Director of Strategy at Red uh, Redbridge, forgive me, uh, the London Borough of Redbridge, and much to talk about. We've done, this, um, we've done this report now because we want to have as much impact as we can on the spending review that is certainly due to be launched uh, next year, Brexit obviously hanging a great cloud of uncertainty over aspects of that but in discussions with the Treasury, and we can take a hint, they said, well, look, if you say something in September, there is a chance of us being able to take it into account. So we have done that. But this is part of a wider set of arguments, as I, as I hinted, about public, uh, public spending, the management of public spending, and about the, the performance of government and the accountability for that within the government, which we push out through various angles of our research, but it's certainly going to be one of the big themes here. So with that, we're going to run possibly slightly past 10 o'clock, and we've given you advance notice of this uh, in the emails that came out, just to give enough uh, time for discussion, uh, but no offense taken if some people have to go at 10. We will absolutely not run past 10.15 and may stop a bit before then. Thank you for your uh, indulgence on that. And with that, Martin. <clears throat> well, thank you, Bronwyn, both as chair and co-author, and I must also thank uh, Tess, likewise, and the magnificent uh, events and publications team in the uh, Institute, without whom, of course, these uh, publications and events would just not happen. It's a magnificent team here, uh, and I'm very grateful to them and to the research colleagues <coughs> who've been a big help with this project, too. I should also thank a huge number of people who've given very generously of their time, Whitehall officials, former Whitehall officials, former ministers, uh, lots of other intelligent commentators on this set of issues, because likewise, without them, we wouldn't have done that. That very much includes you, James, and your uh, colleagues. Um, I don't suppose you particularly uh, in the market for our unsolicited advice, but uh, you've put up with our, our involvement in this topic uh, very generously. And while we argue that some things can and should be done better, uh, we say that because uh, the Treasury has a difficult and important job to do, uh, and we are offering some ideas about how it could be done better. The structure of the report is there as you see it, um, fairly, fairly straightforwardly, and I, I won't go through that, and we'll get straight into the substance of this presentation, which will follow that structure. Uh, a lot of you here know far more about spending reviews than I do, but for the benefit of anyone who is a new reader, spending reviews are the process by which the government sorts out its plans for spending, and specifically in current parlance, the bit of spending called DEL, uh, Departmental Expenditure Limits, which is spending on the main public services and investment. Um, in parallel, the government will certainly be thinking about what is in fact now, as you see from this graph, a somewhat larger component of public spending uh, uh, called AMI, Annually Managed Expenditure, which is pensions and welfare. And of course, between the total of public spending, uh, there is scope uh, to trade uh, between the two. What spending reviews are not, and this is quite important, is the formal process through which Parliament permits the government to spend money. Uh, they are a statement of political intent by the government, and the Parliament actually uh, sets aside the money through a separate process uh, called estimates. 
The current way of doing spending reviews has been going for about 20 years now. Um, the graphic here shows that in a typically UK way, uh, there are not set intervals to how often spending reviews happen, uh, and they plan for varying periods ahead. Uh, it's all uh, obviously very much driven by uh, political circumstances, things like dates of election and so on. But broadly, they happen at intervals of, uh, of two to four years or so, looking ahead, up to five years ahead. So why do spending reviews matter? Um, the, 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 the first is that, that clearly the government, uh, that what the government spends is a, a vital part of its overall macro <coughs> strategy uh, and it has to uh, plan total spending uh, from all government departments, local government and everything else in the NHS um, to live within the spending total it decides is affordable um, as part of its broader strategy. And that is at the most basic level what the process is about. However, uh, it does uh, or can do other things um, politicians, of course, want stuff to happen, and money is one of the main tools for that. Um, spending money on infrastructure and skills, if you do it right, should make the economy more productive. And uh, any financial pr planning process should, very importantly, be an opportunity uh, to drive better value and performance out of public services. Now I'll move on to what we've drawn out of our conversations uh, and research about what works well and what needs to be improved. And James, you and your colleagues shouldn't take the fact that there are three of the former and five of the latter in this presentation in the wrong way. Because the three things that work well are really rather important. Um, the first is that uh, for all there is a lot of drama and hijinks along the way, um, some of it uh, conducted pretty publicly by ministers, it started already ahead of next year, um, we do tend to get to a deal in the end and the numbers add up. Secondly, uh, in the years following reviews, by international standards, the UK sticks pretty well to what has been agreed, if you see here. Um, of the UK there um, with a fairly minor variance from its plans compared with uh, a load of other countries. And um, the stuff happens, plans change, but generally in the UK the Treasury presides over a set of processes which means that that reflects conscious decisions, not just um, absent-minded uh, running over the budgets. Um, and third, um, an important thing that we picked up from politicians and officials of both eras is that when there are these pivot points in British politics, the two most recent being 1997-98 and in 2010, um, spending reviews are a very important part of uh, what somebody called turning the super tanker. So, um, Taking the example of the 2010 review, uh, one former Treasury official we spoke to said, um, when it started off, the machine didn't believe there really were going to be cuts, there really was going to be a reversal of 13 years of, of broadly expansionary approach to public spending, but the spending review did succeed in turning around that long-term trend. Now, all of these three positive points are underpinned by a staff team that has enormous strengths, that is bright, accepting of responsibility, um, works well together internally as a team uh, and is increasingly drawing on professional expertise from the finance function, from the commercial and other functions in the Cabinet Office. Those are all very real strengths, but because uh, we uh, think that, uh, that, that there's scope to do even better, we've drawn from the literature and our conversations five important areas uh, where we think there is room for improvement. There's much more detail in the report, but in quick headline terms, first of all, um, uh, ministers' reflections are on, on a spectrum from those who clearly had a whale of a time uh, playing the politics of the spending review process to those who found it all a dysfunctional bore. What was not clear from any of those conversations was uh, whether that uh, political melee led to sound spending plans at a departmental level 
or to important cross-governmental themes being addressed in a structured and sensible way. So it's the politics driving out any sense of strategy. Second, um, the numbers certainly do add up in spreadsheet terms uh, and, and, and sort of work for the announcement, but there are all sorts of ways in which they are less than fully reliable. Document this uh, a lot more fully in the report, but the basic problem is like any negotiation, the pressure for both sides to get to yes leads to the acceptance of over-optimistic assumptions, the shunting of costs into other programmes sideways, uh, shunting costs out into the future through uh, accounting uh, devices, and a lack of attention to the long term. Um, I don't know how many people in this, this room are avid readers of the Office for Budget Responsibilities Fiscal Sustainability Report. Uh, certainly good if you're ever having trouble sleeping any time. But seriously, um, th this is a deeply, deeply worrying uh, set of reports that the OBR has been producing since its uh, inception. And the report they published just before uh, the summer break is deeply worrying about the impact of ageing and other fiscal pressures on uh, the UK's public finances. Finally, there's, there's, there's no independent marking of the government's homework in terms of the credibility, particularly of the relationship between spending allocations and what can be got out of them. Um, the third area, um, though it's not a unanimous view, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the overall balance of opinion uh, in the people we've talked to is to feel that um, the UK has, uh, has lost something in recent years through uh, the, 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 the abandonment after 2010 of the focus on performance and outcomes, which developed over the decade or so before. Um, and um, uh, nobody's saying that that was a perfect system, but um, it <coughs> was encouraging some kind of uh, parallel discussion of how much money and what you do with it, which is rather important. I know following uh, work Michael Barber did for the Treasury last year, the Treasury is now building up um, some capability and systems to have uh, a focused dialogue with departments about these issues. And I think we in the Institute hope very much that that will uh, yield some fruit in next year's spending review. I feel it's important it should. I said that the Treasury's staffing model has strengths, and it certainly does, and I'm not criticising anyone who works there, um, but um, there, there is a lot of concern outside the Treasury about whether the staffing model is quite balanced enough, uh, whether despite recent increases in uh, capability on that front, the Treasury emphasises professional finance skills enough for a finance ministry, whether it has enough people with lived experience of the public services and who know how things actually work, whether <coughs> annual turnover close to 25% gets in the way of de developing the insights and relationships which um, some former spending uh, officials who had been uh, a bit longer in post than usual said was really important for their effectiveness. And more than once, uh, former Treasury officials compared themselves to uh, Millwall and they said rather proudly everyone hates us and we don't care. Now and that's, that's great for esprit de corps and while it uh, wasn't uh, in currency when I worked in the Treasury, uh, the certainly philosophy behind it may have been. Um, but, um, and, and the other thing you have to say of course is that finance ministries will never win popularity contests. But um, we think there is a, an issue for the Treasury about thinking more about its external reputation uh, and the behaviours and communications which drive that, which is, uh, leads me on to my final point, which is about transparency and communication. So first, um, the, the, the public documentation, uh, which we explain more in the report, uh, is very complex and not at all user-friendly. Even really expert uh, committee advisers in the House of Commons say they can't make sense of it. So uh, uh, what, what, what hope the rest of us? Um, second, um, we picked up a strong concern about external engagement uh, and reputation <laughs> management, um, particularly from public and third sector professionals outside Whitehall, who are the people who are, are making the public services system work. So one council chief executive said, I've never felt so disconnected from Whitehall 
uh, and so not listened to. Challenges of next year, Bronwyn, you already touched on them, uh, but, but um, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty obvious uh, in terms of the um, political position of the government and, of course, uh, Brexit and its, uh, its, its domination of political headspace. The third thing, though, is about the national uh, finances. Um, and the government's caught between, on the one hand, very real signs of services <laughs> under pressure and there'll be a, another institute uh, publication in a few weeks performance tracker which uh, documents that further um, <coughs> and austerity fatigue which is certainly all over uh, all over the media and uh, a lot of uh, lobbying groups but also uh, quite being uh, voiced quite explicitly by uh, ministers it's got to balance all that with deep-seated concern about many of its, from many of its political supporters that it needs to stick to the course in driving down the size of the state and cutting taxes. So sort of illustrate that in terms of how difficult things are and the limited uh, range of choices available. I mean, the graph here, the pink being the past and the blue and yellow, um, the two most recent forecasts of the future, um, this, is, this is current plans for uh, the reduction in public borrowing. Um, now, uh, if you continue on that declining uh, path, the government said it wants to drive further towards zero PSBR by the middle of the decade. Um, well, they can stick to that trajectory. Um, having uh, uh, committed a huge amount of money to the NHS, 20 billion by 2023-24, and if you don't increase his taxes, taxes significantly, by our broad calculations, the spending review is then going to have to look at taking a further 21 billion out of non-health uh, services and investment by 2022-23. <coughs> Even, however, if the government wanted to ignore the fiscal hawks among its own supporters and others and just hold spending uh, a bit below 2% of GDP, which is not high by historic standards. Um, it could fund the NHS commitment, avoid further real terms cuts to other public services in aggregate, though with a strange showing in certain areas, that is not going to let it off the hook, having to find uh, real savings in some areas at least, in my view. And we have seen some, uh, some, I don't know whether it's about the case of a swallow making a summer, but some reasonably uh, good news uh, recently on, on, on borrowing and employment and things like that, which may ease the, the pressures on annually managed expenditure. But it's early days, particularly with all the Brexit uncertainty, to think that that is going to uh, provide a painless uh, surge of revenue and decline in welfare costs and so on to make the review a lot easier. So that's enough about um, uh, the background and uh, the past. What do we actually think should be done uh, differently? Um, we make uh, over 20 suggestions or proposals, which I, you'll be relieved to hear I'm not going to go through uh, one by one. I'm going to go through the main headings <coughs> and pick out um, some of the things that may be of more interest. Some of this is uh, we're very keen to see pursued next year, uh, uh, and we're not going to allow the Treasury to indulge in the normal Whitehall thing, which is to say that's all a wonderful idea, but we can't get round to it just yet. But clearly, and in seriousness, some of this stuff is uh, big and will need to be continued after next year. The first thing we say is the government needs to be clear about uh, where it's heading for, and that's not only resolving uh, as soon as it can, uh, uh, how, where, where it needs to come out financially on the spending review as a way of conditioning uh, political expectations about the amount of money available. But very importantly, and this is something I think is a bit different from recent practice, that uh, we think the process would really be helped if there was a statement about where the government wants to take public services uh, and investment uh, in the next few years and after Brexit. One former uh, minister I spoke to said it's really important the spending review uh, communicates what kind of country we want to be. And we think this is an opportunity uh, politically as well as something that would help the spending review work better, some sort of template of substance against which to set 
the difficult financial decisions. Secondly, um, we, we, I know it's probably not what, uh, what the, what, what, what the, how the Treasury sees it rolls at the moment, but we are saying very firmly that spending reviews must have a much stronger focus on what is done with and achieved by the money, not just how much it is. We don't think that uh, decisions about performance and outcomes can be left to departments after the process, and the Treasury's dialogue needs to be about the two together, uh, and ensuring that it and the department can properly evidence and explain the relationship between the two. The end of the spending review process, therefore, rather than just publishing a very high level set of numbers, the Treasury and Department should publish an agreed statement about their spending and performance plans for the spending review period. And we are suggesting that the NAO should provide some external assurance about the uh, assumptions and modelling which underpin those statements. Um, beyond this, uh, and, and a parallel uh, piece of IFG work about accountability, we're coming out soon, um, we will be thinking more about how there can be more external assurance of whether the spending and performance numbers that are coming out of Whitehall are valid. The third thing is that, that as well as settling the departmental programmes, the Treasury needs to uh, look at a certain set of issues across the whole of government and avoid the tendency for this just to become a series of bilateral discussions. The, the ones we've picked out in the report, there could be more of course, but um, the first is the spending requirements and pressures associated with Brexit. This is a big project for the government, um, uh, all too much likely to think if uh, departments are just thinking about it individually, we won't get to a sensible picture across government. Secondly, local government. It's affected by the decisions and actions of 13 different government departments. It's the uh, area of public spending under most strain from previous spending reductions. And exactly how its future funding is done after 2020 has not been sorted out. Third, building on uh, Michael Barber's uh, work last year, we think there should be a strong cross-government search for value improvement. And the Treasury shouldn't be shy about enlisting Whitehall's non-executive directors and other external uh, people to provide challenge uh, and ideas. And one element of that could be uh, a thorough testing of uh, whether more local control and decision making about public spending would lead to better uh, value in local public services. And then uh, we think that uh, the very good work that the Treasury has initiated and published on risk now with uh, input from the OBR should be carried forward into uh, a cross uh, departmental assessment of financial risk, which is much more robust than these things have been done in the past. Fourth, addressing what I said earlier about the, uh, about the documentation of spending and performance plans and reporting. Um, uh, we, we think that there's scope to improve this. It's a big agenda, it's for Parliament as well as the government, um, and will need to be pursued beyond next year. Uh, the review is an opportunity for the government to make some first steps on that front and propose to Parliament a set of processes through which this set of issues will be taken forward. And the Procedure Committee of the House of Commons has launched an inquiry on the case for a dedicated <coughs> committee to look at spending plans. Uh, the Institute will be submitting evidence and looking to support Parliament and the government in rethinking these important points. On uh, professional skills and capability, um, this again is not something for a quick fix, but uh, the Treasury could make some selected short-term hires to boost its own internal knowledge about some of the most difficult challenges. I saw this done myself um, 15 years ago or so in the Treasury. Um, and then the, the, the Whitehall non-executive directors, other experts, could be brought in to provide some challenge and help. Um, beyond next year, we argue that the Treasury needs to rethink, quite fundamentally, the staffing of the spending directorate, addressing the issues I mentioned earlier of uh, finance professionalism, programme knowledge and turnover. In our closing chapter, we just sketch out a few uh, bigger and longer term 
uh, issues, uh, including the old chestnut about whether the boundaries of the Treasury and its relationship with the Cabinet Office are uh, right, who is providing leadership in the UK government about public service design and transformation, um, and, um, uh, and, and uh, other uh, topics uh, for which we will be returning to as an institute. Well, thank you very much, Prof. Martin, well, thank you very much indeed. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So if you are um, of this tribe and interested in these issues and do pick up the OBR July report, it might well keep you awake at night, it seems to me, given that it says to keep the public services where they are at the moment. Uh, tax revenues might have to rise by several uh, percentage points of, of GDP, let alone before what a government or a Labour government might want to do. Now, all that for another subject. Um, James, let me, let me come to you. Uh, uh, a series of, of, of challenges there, five challenges, in fact, uh, there are three points where we say uh, the numbers add up and, uh, 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 and the UK uh, is better than some other countries in doing that. What's, what's your feeling about this? Well, look, thank you very much to the IFG, Martin, for um, your report. It's incredibly useful and well-timed as we uh, gear up for the spending review. Lots to learn uh, there, and I recognise the challenges. Um, let me, I'll, I'll, I'll gently push back on some of your sources views and I'll, I'll tell a little bit of a story about how the Treasury is changing, particularly in recent years, as mm. I uh, answer that question, Bronwyn, if I may. So I'll, I'll cover um, the wider context quickly, uh, gearing up for the spending review and then, and then how we operate the capability and capacity function. So um, the wider context, three macroeconomic points um, make the context, Martin referred to them all. Um, on the economy, we've got the uncertainty of Brexit, and we've got uh, GDP growth forecast at 1.5% uh, for, the, for, the, for the coming years on average, which is below uh, pre-crisis levels. On the public finances, we've got debt having risen from 40% uh, to 85%, and the uh, issues that have in uh, our ability to absorb future shocks. Yeah. And um, the report you're all uh, talking about uh, on the longer term issues. The OBR report. The OBR yeah. report. Um, left unchecked, we face increasing pressure on debt. Mm. I think the, 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 the scary number is 260% uh, mm. by 2060 something uh, uh, from an aging population and the intergenerational issues that that uh, raises. So these are the challenges and they're far from straightforward, but we can be confident that the UK's architecture is judged one of the best in uh, the world as we gear up for this. So um, you mentioned them, but um, you know, uh, I can't help but copy you. So the IMF says we're the best in Europe at sticking to our spending plans. The OECD ranks the UK third on the use of performance budgeting. The IMF says we're at the forefront on fiscal transparency. We're the only country in the world that publishes whole of government accounts. And I think, you know, this isn't just about the Treasury. Mm. The existence of the OBR, mm. where I think actually the scrutiny issue lies, um, mm. is, uh, is significant. Its, its fiscal risks report and its long-term sustainability are globally uh, leading uh, pieces of the architecture. So gearing up for the spending review and, and Martin's um, challenges, uh, let me pick out um, three areas where, where we do want to do more. So. Um, Long-term and cross-cutting uh, agenda is um, always a, a key uh, determinant for a spending view, and uh, we definitely want to do more in that area. Um, some of the foundations are, are set. We have, for example, a <coughs> National Infrastructure Commission now uh, reporting independently on what the long-term challenges are mm. on infrastructure and cross-cutting solutions to deliver them. We'll look to the spending view to uh, draw on that and indeed use um, evidence base, uh, an evidence base on where our capital can best be spent to, to get the maximum returns. Um, we also in the Treasury on, on the issue of, of cost shunting in particular have a, an explicit team now called the Costings Unit uh, that looks at where costs lie regardless of their departmental uh, silo and uh, looks to, to think about uh, how best we can therefore address costs as they lie and that's going to be a key a part of our architecture for the spending view as we look for a more long-term cross-cutting approach. Um, 
Martin, your report mentions the balance sheet, and uh, I very much agree with you that um, you know marginal changes in budgets can be absolutely dwarfed by changes in assets and liabilities, uh, which arguably uh, go uh, less noticed. Um, so the challenge for us is to use both the whole of government accounts, but also uh, the uh, much improved annual accounts by departments to really look at the balance sheet information that we are uh, providing and how we manage uh, best those assets and liabilities. And there's a balance sheet review, uh, which will inform the spending review. We had the NAO invited to our finance leaders group uh, yesterday to talk about this and other areas. Um, on uh, performance, um, Martin, you absolutely rightly say the performance frameworks have, have come and gone. Um, uh, there's many people in the audience who uh, have uh, um, designed those uh, over the past. Um, you're right, we asked um, Michael Barber to do a review on that, and I'd very much recommend his report. And chapter one is a, an excellent summary of the history of this, uh, these changes. Um, Michael has set out a performance value framework, which we are piloting. We are also looking to integrate the single departmental planning uh, process into our plans better, as we do look to deliver a more stable, sustainable performance framework uh, for the future. So a challenge to rise to there. Um, finally, you um, uh, talked about how we operate as a treasury, and I wanted to uh, pick out some reflections, particularly of where the tre treasury has uh, been changing over recent years. And I, and I, I do think you, you mentioned many of these, Martin, but I do think this is, isn't well understood. So I'll, 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 I'll try and explain it uh, as best I can. So the, the, the main, um, the, the main ex uh, point to make is that since 2015, uh, there has been a very large investment in the capability and capacity of the functional agenda across uh, government. And <coughs> uh, the uh, Treasury spending teams, which are uh, the focus of much of this report, are married into the work of those, those functional uh, uh, teams. So let me, let me, let me, let me explain. So uh, we now have 160 people in the uh, Infrastructure Project Authority that are professionals on project management and the, uh, the governance and systems on that, including uh, optimism bias, which is uh, an issue that we are all concerned about. There are uh, 280 people in the centre on the commercial function now from zero a few years ago, um, which are professionals at procurement policy. And the recent Carillion experience was a huge test of our ability as a, uh, uh, as a Treasury and Cabinet Office with departments to unpick all of those public sector contracts in, uh, in that particular company when it went uh, into liquidation. Um, on finance, we're doing two things. Uh, we are uh, upskilling the spending teams themselves on finance, and we've made a large investment in the capacity of the Treasury itself on the finance function, um, which uh, includes new drive for qualifications, uh, but also expertise that spending teams can work on. And I won't keep going, but the same is true for, for digital, for uh, human resources, and for property uh, management. Um, the point is that we, we've chosen a model of how we want to professionalise here, which is, that, uh, which is that there is an option to put individuals into each spending team, a, a procurement professional, a, uh, uh, a commercial professional, a, a project professional. We haven't chosen that model. We've chosen to keep um, those together in, in the functions, under, uh, many under John Manzoni. Uh, and we think that is the right model because uh, there are huge economies of scale in keeping people together. And where we've tried in the past to put people in individual teams, they sometimes lack that ability to bounce off each other and build the expertise they need to uh, together. So, so it's been a, a very significant change since 2015 and, and one, um, one I think is, is the right, right way forward. Um, on experience in the Treasury, Martin, I, I recognise um, what you are saying. I, I hope you'll be pleased to know that um, every single one of the spending team uh, leaders in the Treasury have worked in another government department. Half of the spending team leaders are employed directly from other government departments. And this is a sea change, perhaps, from the Treasury you were working in uh, 15 uh, years ago as we look to enhance the experience that we have uh, in the Treasury and we're not uh, you know, an echo chamber, if you like. And thirdly, um, uh, a theme running through your uh, 
report is um, the much needed focus on strategy and value, which I, I, I hugely I recognise. I would say that that um, focus is absolute and, and um, the spending review process can come sometimes um, push uh, people off uh, an understanding of what the Treasury does as its day job, which is value for money. So uh, myself, my directors, my spending team leaders are spending all of their time at the moment on a 10-year health review, on a social care green paper, on a defence review, and uh, the very important set of reforms around whether decisions <coughs> are, uh, uh, are decentralised correctly at local government and the huge sets of reforms at uh, devolved administration uh, level. Uh, the other part of uh, my job, which takes up most of my time, is co-chairing the major project review group, which is looking with the um, Infrastructure Project Authority, I, I co-chair it with John Manzoni, particularly at wrestling these large government projects uh, into, you know, in the implementation and delivery phase, which I think rightly there has been criticism in the past of a, a lack of focus. Uh, uh, and indeed, um, um, often overlooked, but we've, we, pub we updated the, the green book, which sets out how we want to go about this uh, just uh, earlier this uh, year. Um, so that very much sets the scene for the spending view, and that is the day-to-day -day work of the spending view. So whilst um, you know ministers love the, the haggle bit and the you know briefing various correspondents in newspapers, don't forget uh, the the day job. Um, in conclusion, I'd, I'd also just want to say um, um, that I'm immensely proud of the staff in the Treasury. They, uh, I, um, you set out the challenges, I agree with them, I've set out the challenges. Mm. They work in very challenging uh, circumstances. I, I, I reject the Millwall um, uh, suggestion. Um, uh, um, uh, if, th if that machismo existed, then um, you know, go through a financial crisis and go through uh, fiscal consolidation. I, I, I really don't recognise that. What we do have in the Treasury is uh, the most engaged staff in Whitehall. It's not, it's not a competition, but we do have the most engaged staff in Whitehall. <laughs> and I'm, uh, I'm incredibly, your most provocative uh, point yet. <laughs> incredibly uh, proud of uh, the work that they do. Um, and, um, and the work that they will be doing in very challenging circumstances going forward. James, mm. thanks very much. Thanks for coming and, and, and making your points and, 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 um, mm. and countering some of what we've been arguing. I mean, I'll come <coughs> back to you on both the performance and the staff points, two of the key ones we're making. Simon, what's, what's, what's your take on this, um, on how the Treasury's doing on these questions of performance, staff, and knowledge of what it's like to be on the receiving end? Oh, well, I'm tempted to, to leave the Treasury to James and Martin, although I note that um, your spending team leads are coming from departments. They're not coming from frontline public services, which might be an interesting issue to explore later. Um, so I, I'm, I'm the ambassador from Redbridge today, and I probably should say a bit about the place that I'm, I'm here to represent. Um, Redbridge, um, if you don't know, and lots of people don't, uh, we are a borough of 300,000 souls up um, at the top right hand of the London map on the central line and soon to be on Crossrail, and that's a really big deal. Um, it's an exciting place to be at the moment. Um, we've changed a lot of our top management over the last couple of years. We're on a huge journey of change. If you look at the place, um, we have a reputation for being a leafy, semi-Essex suburb. Um, that's still true. If you go up to the north of the borough, that's definitely still true. And There's a folk memory of that throughout the borough. But in the south of the borough, where my office is, in Ilford, it hasn't been true for a very long time. Ilford is hyper-diverse. Uh, the last census we had wards, there were 85% non-white British, and it will be higher by now, because we have whole new communities moving in. Um, Crossrail will pump up our population gigantically um, over the next 15 years or so, anything up to 20% more people coming into Redbridge, which drives huge opportunities for regeneration. We're a substantial landowner, we can do quite a lot to change the way the borough looks. So it, it feels like we're on a very exciting journey, but it's also a very precarious one because for all of those opportunities, we face challenges. Um, our population is both aging and youthening simultaneously, which is quite unusual, but it reflects our migrant communities. In the long run, that puts pressure on both our adults and children's services. That's a big deal. All of those people moving into our borough, they're not moving into a place with lots of council housing. I think we have about four and a half thousand council houses in the whole borough and not many more social units which means people are moving into the private rented sector. They're moving into housing that was never built to house those sorts of numbers. So unsurprisingly, we have big challenges around housing, big challenges around properties and multiple occupation, and actually a surprisingly large street homelessness problem. 
in the midst of all of that, and I guess the reason I'm here, we are in the midst of running our local version of a spending review for the next five years. Um, and we are looking at taking about £55 million out of our budgets. Now, that's about a third of our net budget, which is gigantic. And most of it has to come out in the next three years. I should be honest, that's a pessimistic figure. Uh, some of that's driven by our own decisions locally. We want to pay the London living wage. About 20% of our residents are on low pay, and we need to change that. So we've chosen to do that. Um, and the 55 million includes lots of management against risk and all the rest of it. And it is pessimistic. And by the time we've finished, it might well be a bit smaller. But we have to be pessimistic. I think that's a really important thing to say here. It's absolutely right that we err on the side of pessimism. We can't borrow to subsidise our budgets. We have to balance every year, which means that we can't take a lot of risk. Um, the strategic outlook we're getting from government is highly uncertain. Martin touched on this earlier. Um, of that 55 million, about 8 million is the Better Care Fund. Um, we're holding risk against that as well. If that disappears in two years, which it could, well, that's 4 or 5% of our budget gone overnight. So that's a huge decision we've got to make. Do we take the risk on that 8 million remaining, or do we take it out now and make cuts that we might not need to make in services which have already taken huge sums of money? Um, it's a really hard choice, and we have no clarity. Similarly, after 2020, Martin's already alluded to this, the whole basis upon which we're funded changes dramatically. No more central government money. In theory, we're reliant on council tax and business rates. That's our money, um, which unless the law changes, um, James can't do anything about, touch wood. Um, so we go down to that, but we have no idea how that system is going to work or what that will mean for our budgets. So huge amounts of change, huge amounts of opportunity, but also just a hugely risky outlook and real difficulty for us in planning for the long term because there's so much uncertainty, um, which I guess is really built into this spending review process. And with that clarity, we can make a lot more, uh, we can make better longer term decisions. Without it, we're constantly having to go for pessimistic sets of assumptions and possibly make cuts we don't really need to. It's a real challenge. If I come back to the way that we've handled our version of a spending review, which I think is the thing I can talk about with most authority, I guess if I look at the recent past, what you would have seen is a very traditional approach in Redbridge. Essentially, we set a budget envelope. Sometimes we try and allocate that. Often it was just a proportionate cut across the piece. Everyone find 10%. Forms would go out, ideas would come back, there would be a star chamber, and then basically we would apply Chinese burns to anyone who didn't deliver. Um, which, to be honest, sort of worked in the sense you got lots of savings on the board really quickly, but in the long run didn't work at all, because we had huge optimism bias, um, because we were banking the whole saving people put up on the board. All it took was for one saving not to be delivered, and no matter how many Chinese burns we applied, there wasn't an obvious substitute. So what we did was get lots and lots of salami slicing um, we got loads of salami slicing that all came out on the board, but it was very brittle. There was no resilience built into our budget planning. And that meant that we were constantly firefighting all the time. And I think the critical point in all of this for me is that you can't separate strategy and budget. You can't separate what you want to achieve from the way that you allocate your budget, at least you can't in my organisation. Um, if you'd gone to our staff at any point in the last two years and said, why are we here? What's the point of Redbridge? Why is the council here? They'd have said to balance the books. Well, they would. Um, which is really sad, but it's true because that's what our behaviour told them mattered because we were constantly trying to balance the books because we couldn't uh, get to a long-term strategy because we were constantly trying to get our finances under control to give us thinking space. So what we've done this time round, I don't want to make great claims for this because there are other councils that are far more sophisticated, but for us it was a quantum leap. We said, look, yeah, actually we're running out of options here. We can't just do another round of salami slicing. We don't have the posts. Uh, there are still things that we can cut, don't get me wrong. Um, everyone still has things they can cut. But they are things which are really difficult, which really affect people's lives, and many of which would be hugely painful politically. Um, and options which, frankly, you know, our politicians simply aren't going to take unless they absolutely have to. Um, so we were running out of options, for the, and the traditional way wasn't working because we were constantly in crisis mode. So this time, I guess, if you were to look at it in Whitehall terms, what we did was say we want to combine the strategy and the budget, put it all in one place. We effectively merged the Cabinet Office and the Treasury functions. Yeah. Um, and we built what we call squads, effectively cross-cutting teams. So the finance teams, <laughs> my teams, the transformation people, the policy people, the business intelligence analysts, we formed them all into teams around each of our directorates. And we gave them time. Yeah. We gave them two months, which is nothing in Whitehall terms, but for us, is absolute luxury. Uh, we gave them two months to really look at their data, look at what was driving change, look at where the costs were coming from, to try and start a different discussion. We played all of that back in a series of very, very long intensive meetings with all of our senior managers. So everyone saw everyone else's savings, which helps us to surface the interdependencies and to understand how that would affect our overall strategy. 
Um, what that's done, I think, is create a really different sense of how we do a budget in the council. We're talking about strategy, we're surfacing cross-cutting issues. We've been able to talk about investment for the first time. One of the things that is on our side is that our capital investment's quite low. Our capital program's relatively small by local government standards. So we can borrow to invest. So we've ended up, actually, with quite an ambitious program starting to come forward around how we'll invest in the borough. So that's partly about housing, it's partly about regeneration. If we buy lots of properties in the private rented sector, we can reduce the costs of homelessness. We can reduce the costs of care leaving, all those sorts of things. But equally, we can start investing in people's lives. So you know, one of the things that our, our children's services department is starting to do now is look at if we put some money in up front in some of these children's lives, we can probably reduce their lifelong costs quite significantly. Mm. So how do we manage that? How do we use our reserves and our borrowing imaginatively? Simon, I, we, 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 we've got to press on. Simon. And, 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 and no, it's a terrific album, that portrait of how to, how to run a budget uh, and how, how to have these kind of discussions. And really briefly, the thing that you would most like from central government at this point is what? Is clarity as well as more money? Uh, just looking ahead to next year's spending review from, 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 from a Whitehall point of view, what's the one thing you would like? Um, I would like to see a clear plan for how local public services are funded and some honesty around the impact that that will have on places. That's great, thanks. Let me just pick up one point, um, just coming back to the um, other challenge, sorry to bring it right back to the centre, to, to, to the, the uh, Treasury. And this issue of, of, of you know, who's responsible for the performance of, um, uh, of public services, of, of these departments. And James, I mean, you've um, and kind of talked a lot about the performance issues which Martin's uh, talked about in our, in our, in our report. Um, do you accept the challenge that uh, Martin has, has, has thrown down really with that, that the Treasury should be more responsible for, um, uh, for, for the implications of the spending numbers that it sets departments and for their performance um, that comes out of it? Yep. Great. Um, Not all uh, our conversations Yeah, no quick. problem with that. I mean, I think um, I'm really ha happy with uh, you know, the, the performance side of uh, things has, has fluctuated. Martin uh, described it like that. Ma Michael Barber's uh, uh, report that we, we commissioned describe and agree with described it like that as well. So I think there absolutely is a uh, much stronger desire to uh, link uh, performance into the before, during and after of, uh, of spending. And that's what we'll be looking to, to try and achieve. We're, 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 um, a, uh, just in terms of who's responsible, um, just as a, a, the, just the, the Treasury is not sort of uh, desperate to do everything on its own. So I think you know you'll you'll hear a lot about us working with the Cabinet Office, the single departmental plan process, mm -hmm. where um, you know the the concept of one centre is what, what what departments want to hear from us. They don't want to hear the Treasury having a different plan to mm -hmm. the Cabinet's mm -hmm. Office. Mm. Well, we can dig into this on the staffing and function questions. I see Julian McRae there, among many other people interested in uh, the this, this subject of whether the functions are doing quite as well as you uh, say. Though absolutely, there has been a dramatic change. So let me just ask you finally one really short thing. Uh, you were referring before to the elephant in the room, though the elephant is being prodded and coaxed along at the moment. Uh, is there definitely, because of the Brexit uncertainty, is there definitely going to be a spending review next year? And is it going to be one year or three years? <laughs> yeah, well, I, um, I'm, 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 I'm very careful that, that that news is very much for our ministers to tell uh, Parliament. Uh, um, I think the, um, as the constitutional experts, you can tell me. But, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, you're absolutely right. The Chancellor um, has said there'll be a spending view uh, next year. Um, uh, we have an independent forecasting process of the economy and public finances. <coughs> And I think it's probably uh, the case that the Chancellor, uh, Chief Secretary and Prime Minister want to see a little bit more of what uh, those forecasts are before they take absolutely final uh, decisions. Um, we have a preference for multi-year spending. Reviews. As do we. Thank you very much. <coughs> Let's have some questions. Right, there's a first out of the traps over by the fireplace. Hi there, I'm, I'm Christopher Hood. In Martin's uh, presentation, we passed rather quickly over minority government and Brexit issues. Um, but I'd quite like to bring you back to that because it seems to me that there are three principles of spending reviews that are linked rather closely to that. One is the principle that you review all aspects of government spending at once, something that goes back to the Plowden report of the early 60s. 
Uh, the second is the idea that you, des that, that you decide the envelope before you decide allocations within the envelope, uh, a principle first established in 1992. And third, the principle of budgeting over more than one year, which, as you say, is, uh, has more or less applied, at least for parts of the public spending, uh, since the late 90s. All of these things, all three of those, depend on some measure of cabinet solidarity and discipline. And, and the question I've got is, do we have enough cabinet solidarity and discipline to support any of those principles, let alone all of them? Thank you very much. And Christopher, you're working on a project about the Treasury yourself with Nuffield. Yeah. I, um, yeah. Christopher's book mm. is working very mm. closely with us, and I would Absolutely. very much recommend his book on the history of public uh, yeah. spending, which is um, the best account there is out there. Okay, we have unanimity on Christopher's book, but uh, do we have a cabinet, cabinet uh, unanimity? I'm going to look to Martin. Was he um, asking Martin? Yes, yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> I'm asking Martin. Well, um, we'll see, won't we? I think I, uh, uh, the, the <laughs> looking from outside, and um, it's very easy to say these things uh, when one isn't any longer in the system and having to work with real live ministers. Um, I, I think, I think, I think, and clearly the, um, the not so much the timing of the NHS announcement, <coughs> but the fact that it didn't have firmly enough wired into it what was going to be done with the money, uh, enough about the relationships between uh, pressures uh, on the health service and other public services, um, uh, is a symptom of uh, a government that uh, is under the kind of pressures that you're talking about, uh, Christopher. Um, uh, for the future, um, I, I think there's definitely, definitely uh, one or two people we talked to during this process said that um, one of those things that uh, we've said in the report that the UK is good at, which is getting to a settlement at the end, which kind of adds up, that there is more of a risk of that not happening this time than at any time in the last uh, 20 years. But we'll have to see, won't we? I mean, this is the process by which the Cabinet might... Uh yeah, arrive at arrive, arrive at unity. It's um these are difficult times in public finances, and it's uh, I think we're it's not just this government that would face it. Right. There's um there was another one. Sorry, second row. Yep. And then you, uh, but uh, taking trying to take people in the order that they are sticking their hands up. Right. Whole cluster over here. I'm coming to please. Uh, Malcolm Chalmers from from the Royal United <coughs> Services Institute. Uh, I'm particularly interested in defence and security uh, budgeting, uh, which has some unique characteristics. And uh, to some extent, uh, budgets for defence and overseas development uh, are protected because we are still committed to the 2% and 0.7% targets. But those targets, I'd be interested in your observations, have led to a degree of perverse behaviour as departments try to fit what they're doing uh, within those particular targets. And one of the ways in the last spending review the Treasury tried to mitigate that, those effects uh, was having uh, the Strategic Defence and Security Review, which was cross-cutting mm. across a number of departments. Uh, they had the aid strategy, which uh, sought to in ensure that the Foreign Office and others could access uh, the aid budget. And they had something called the, the Joint uh, Security Fund, uh, which uh, encouraged the MOD and the intelligence services to trade off between themselves <laughs> to see what was the best way to use uh, the 2%. So my, I guess my question is, uh, is the Treasury, to your knowledge, looking at ways in which to continue methods of cross-departmental allocation along the lines of those previous exercises in the, in the forthcoming spending review? Uh, yeah, I think there's, there, there's the fund area and there's, it won't be to answer, there's the fund area and the um, allocation <laughs> mechanisms. I mean, I think the big um, advance on, on the defence side of things is the apparatus coming out of Downing Street and the Cabinet Office and the National Security uh, Council, which does look uh, really helpfully, make the, look cross-cuttingly uh, and, you know, a, a whole sort of cabinet and... Um, committee governance section, which looks at together. And I think the spending view will very much play through that with Mark Sedwell as the national uh, security advisor. 
on, on the use of uh, um, funds to affect uh, joint working and change, I think that is definitely a, a mechanism um, we use. I mean, on, on the one hand, I'd point to um, Simon's experience where um, I don't think local government like the history of having 10,000 funds pointed at it and all the targets that went with it and they preferred a, a decentralised approach and I think that is the right approach but on knotty areas where there is a case for uh, you know, uh, uh, pushing more cross-government uh, work I think funds can work um, really rather well and um, we'll be looking on the, uh, on the defence side of things of what, what's worked and ha what hasn't worked um, uh, and I, I don't think there'll be too vast disagreement on, on that front. Hi, Dennis Tunnicliffe, uh, House of Lords. Uh, Martin, you spoke about transparency, and we have great post-review transparency and paper that would, it weighs a ton. But could you comment on transparency of the process? Is there, at the moment, <coughs> transparency of the process is transparency by leak? Uh, would it be better if we had a much more open process where actual bids were published and debated in the public domain. Interesting. So, uh, Martin and um, Simon, I'd love your views as well on uh, transparency. Um, I, I guess it depends when it starts. I think our view in the Institute, um, uh, and apologies if this seems a bit cautious, is that the process, there does need to be some space within which ministers can debate the options, and uh, if only for the, the key reason that inevitably this process will involve some ministers having to retreat from initial positions. Um, and that necessary part of the process is obviously going to be far more difficult um, if it's highly transparent exactly how much they've retreated. Where I think I mean, some of the things that we're floating in the report about improved transparency, though they start um, uh, Im immediately when the government states its intentions. So I think spending review documents are very high level at the moment about uh, budgets. They don't have a lot, uh, they don't really have anything in them about performance. Certainly we think there's there's case for um, parliamentary, more parliamentary discussion and scrutiny after the spending review is published with good quality information to support that as well as a much stronger annual estimates process, which is, 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 is really uh, uh, genuine. We've also talked about the, whether the NAO would take on a role and talked uh, with, with them about it um, in, in terms of scrutinizing the uh, robustness of the process that's actually happened. But your point, there is an inescapable political point in there that it may suit some ministers or it may, they may think it suits them to have this debate in public. Don't, just on scrutiny, don't, just don't forget about the OBR. Yes. No, that is a, a, a massive independent yes. scrutinizer of the public finances, um, which I think is, uh, makes our architecture much stronger. Okay. Mm -hmm. did, did you have a quick point on that? Um, mm. Well, I think just to echo Martin's point, which is you, know, you can't have an honest debate if everything's being mm. set out in public, but I think the way that we set out what the goals of a spending review <coughs> ought to be is important. Do the public understand what the spending review is supposed to achieve? And also just understanding the impact downstream on both frontline public services and on the public, actually, who don't often get much of a look into the spending review process. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really important point. Let's come over here. Um, uh, Julian. Uh, Julian McRae, um, King's College London, and also uh, an associate at the Institute. Um, James, you gave a really interesting um, outline of the changes that have been made inside the Treasury and bringing together the functional agenda and things like that. Something that actually I think has been going on, Sharon White in 2013, I think probably kicked a lot of this stuff off, kept going on to Julian Kelly, your predecessor, and now you. So it's great to see the continuity uh, that's gone into this. I wonder though if I could push you a little on the ambition and pace. So you've touched a couple of times on single departmental plans, so these are essentially ways of bringing together the priorities of departments with the funding and resources and also making sure there's a capability there to achieve that. Very, very good idea driven, as you say, by John Manzoni. Um, the first plans were published in 2016, the work went on on them in 2015. We're now 2018, two and a half, three years later. We're still talking about perhaps making sure they integrate with a spending review process to take place next year. Um, some departments take these very seriously, some departments see them very much as a compliance ticks box exercise. 
what date would you put on it to say when we should expect the Treasury to be saying, and departments concurring, that single departmental plans are fundamentally integrated with our financial and performance control in government? When should we expect that to happen? I think, well, I think that's the challenge, um, um, Julian. Um, I think they have developed, and I, I completely recognise your, your, um, your characterisation that some are better than others. Um, um, might. Mike Drivers in the room from the MOJ, and I think is at the um, at the top end of integration and all of that. So I think there's a, a role for the Treasury and Cabinet Office to to reduce the variation in performance on that front. And um, I don't have a date for you, but our, our, our clearly we are going to want to use that architecture to feed integrate into the <coughs> into the spending review. The Institute's view, which Gavin Freegard has been writing, is that they got better after a week's start, but still have way too many. Uh, goals in them. Here, on the edge. Oh, I'm Caroline Slowcock, and uh, back in the late 1990s, I redesigned the public expenditure system uh, and created Dell uh, and Amy uh, the three year comprehensive spending reviews and public service agreements. And um, I'm very uh, struck, and perhaps I'm particularly well placed to say this, that these reforms didn't really work. You know, but they're not being questioned, uh, I think, uh, sufficiently on the platform. You know, we intended uh, to create uh, longer-term spending plans. We intended to give people like Simon the ability to plan confidently for the next three years. That was the purpose of Dell. Uh, we intended to protect capital expenditure. We had a one-way valve where you couldn't uh, raid capital expenditure to fund current expenditure. Meanwhile, in local authorities and the NHS, capital assets are being sold off to pay for, uh, to plug holes in current expenditure. Um, we need a system which is much more long term. And I, I just like to make a plea to look at that system again, and particularly to look at the focus on uh, investment uh, in the long term to uh, change those liabilities on the balance sheet that the OBR uh, so eloquently uh, are describing, and to stop people like Simon having to constantly work just on a numbers game mm. for you know the next year ahead to cut back on all those short term things. And I'm not just talking about capital, but but also investments in early action, the things which would actually, uh, the things which are being cut back wholesale at the moment, that would actually make a real difference for the long term. So think big uh, and uh, do it again. Reform the public expenditure system. Thank you very much indeed for that, Can James. Are you ab absolutely pleased? Um, uh, and then I, I'll, I'll I come was. Um, I think I was two or three doors down from you, Caroline, when you were inventing all of uh, that. And I remember the weekend where we. You were tasked with um, inventing public service agreements. Um, uh, um, uh, really hoping work-life balance has improved in the Treasury since those uh, days. Um, but um, no, I think it's a good plea. I mean, I think um, I, I wouldn't be too um, pessimistic. I think on, um, particularly on capital, obviously there was uh, a restraint on capital post 2010. But um, you know, the, the, there is some new architecture here with uh, the National Infrastructure Commission and uh, the National Productivity and Investment Fund, which is, is, is much more long term and is much more cross cutting. Um, the challenges still uh, remain, um, uh, but I, I wouldn't um, completely despair. And, um, you know, in terms of our it's not um, despairing. She's saying it hasn't it hasn't changed. It hasn't it hasn't okay. developed in the way it was no, intended. I, okay, and um, you know, as I as we talk to finance ministries around the world, I mean, the three year budgeting point is is um, you know uh, you know subject to change and all the rest of it. But we're we're still uh, um, uh, you know our colleagues in in different finance ministries still look to us as um, having delivered more from from the reforms that you set up uh, um, in terms of that longevity of budgeting than before. Um, I very much take the, uh, the, the, the stresses and strains on local government. Though. I mean, do you want to say, do you feel you're dealing with a system that has uh, uh, um, unintended consequences or this is not how it was planned? I think three-year indicative budgets are, are really helpful. Um, and it's useful to see that. I guess you know there is a certain amount of scepticism, I think, when you're at the front line about, you know, 
you can set out three or four year settlements will either be stuck to? I mean, the answer is probably not. Um, I guess where I sit from a local authority perspective, um, the big challenge we've got is that we have so few, tool, so few tools to actually manage that risk. So I guess you know, one of the obvious things is that we have to balance the budget every year, um, and we have to balance it on the basis of figures that we often find out only two or three months before mm. we have to actually start spending the money. Mm. So you know, if you can't give us spending security, you could at least give us more tools to manage the risk, like being able to borrow over a longer period of time, for instance. You know, maybe not balancing over one year, but balancing over three, mm. which I think is quite a radical step for this country, but I think would hugely mm. help us to manage our budgets. Really, really interesting point. Thanks. Here, and then, then I'm coming further back. I uh, uh, played a small part in the 2004 um, spending review, which uh, was at the flood tide of regionalism, where there was a real effort to both involve uh, regions and think through the implications of, uh, of the spending reviews on the different regions. And I'm hearing today that we've had a retreat really into a Whitehall departmentalism, uh, and I guess a plea like to revive some of the uh, thinking that lay behind that uh, original uh, radical view of, of spending reviews. Would you like to give your name for people watching on live stream? You want to say your name? Oh, uh, yes, I'm Nick Charman. Yeah. Uh, 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 my experience was of, from the regions, uh, regional development agencies, and then DTI. Um, well, um, I, I, I don't think we're trying to portray a, a retreat into um, Whitehall departmental things. I mean, often that's where the focus is. But of course, um, uh, you know, there is there is um, three big decentralisations underway, which I think you know is a huge reform in um, white, in uh, in government, which is often overlooked. Um, I mean, massive changes in uh, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Mm. Um, uh, uh, you know, regardless of quantum, a huge difference in um, accountability. Um, at the regional level, obviously, the emergence of mayors and city uh, roles, which I think will be uh, very prominent in the spending uh, review, and um, you know, weren't there actually in, in so much in 2004, though the RDA uh, structure uh, was. And at the local authority level, I mean, there's issues of quantum, obviously, but. Um, uh, you know the, the the big change from the the hundreds of Whitehall grants to uh, the, the the change that Simon uh, explained in terms of um, uh, called, um, council tax and business rates uh, uh, retention and, and the mm. preset model. So I think there's a lot going on, and it must um, must must figure prominently in a, in, a, in a spending view outcome. So uh, um, uh, there'll be a lot of regional focus. Thanks for that. Back, back over here. Uh, Chris Foster, uh, Better Government Initiative. I mean, many, many interesting suggestions to listen to, and that's been fascinating. Uh, but I'd like to suggest that there is one thing that is even more fundamental, which has been touched on in a couple of questions, but really, without it, we will not really ever achieve anything approach the control that good business control reaches. And it was, it was, um, presented in the excellent reports that were done for uh, the um, CIFG on infrastructure, and in particular also by the National Infrastructure Commission in their report. And that is ultimately you need to get to a situation where you can <coughs> trust the cost estimates. They are published from when they are first made until they are finally uh, adopted and ch checked later in public that the costs were reasonably realistic. And even more fundamental than that is that one gets to a situation where um, cost-benefit analysis, you actually get a, a, an estimate that the benefits secured exceed the costs. Um, Thank you. And so your, your question is... Uh, my question is, would the panel agree but unless one gets to that level of expertise, there will be something seriously lacking in uh, spending views. Priority has to be given to where it's most important because it's very big. This sort of thing, but what, what really matters, but we need to begin to develop. That's my question. 
Thank you very much indeed. Let me take a, a, a few because we're coming right to the end and, and there's still a few people with hands up that I want to get in. Right here in the front and, and, then, and, the, and then behind. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Graham Atkins from the Consultancy Corn Ferry. Um, a question for Martin. Um, the report looks really great. Lots of really big picture recommendations. So I was just wondering, given that many of our clients and the Treasury are kind of midstream preparing for the spending review now, what's the one thing that you'd want the Treasury to do to take away from your report that they could actually implement between now and when the review is announced? Great. And two rows behind you. Hi, uh, my name is Tim Doran. I work here at the Institute, but I was on a spending team uh, in the 2015 SR. Um, and one of the things I think we did really well then was have a good relationship with the department that we were working with. So I wondered, and this is something Martin picked up in his presentation, I wondered if the panel had any sort of tips or pointers for what departments need to be thinking about now ahead of next year, and also local authorities in the wider public sector. Okay, great. Any last shouts? Uh, or let's, let's capture those. Okay, we have... Uh, cost-benefit analysis and a general point about, about, about skills and the level of skills. We have what the uh, Treasury should do before next spring, uh, particularly to, to Martin, uh, from these recommendations. And we have uh, the relationship between departments and what departments should, uh, between departments and the Treasury and what departments uh, should be doing now. Let me start with uh, uh, you, you, Simon. Any, any, any thoughts you want to hang on this? I'll come to James and then Martin. Um. <coughs> So it's just the main ones about, about the relationships piece, because that's been a huge part of, of, of what we've been doing over the last couple of years. Um, and I, I guess the answer is that the, um, and this, this becomes much harder in national government than in a local authority, but the, but the more that you can kind of break down those barriers between departments, between directorates, the better, I think. You know, ultimately, there's one sum of money. In our case, it's about £170 million, pounds, and there's only so many places it can go. So I think the thing that's been transformative for us is being able to have a conversation in the round across all of our spend around where the priorities are and how we support each other to deliver on them, rather than 12, 13, 14 individual conversations we then try and stack up at the centre. So the more that you can get towards that kind of collaborative relationship, excepting in Whitehall, it may, you know, that, that may be utopian, um, the better, I would say. I very much agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I very much agree that um, good relations um, are a key to getting things uh, done and um, you know a, a, a real goal for the Treasury which is partly why I mentioned the fact that we recruit many more people from outside the Treasury than we used to is to, to cement those. Um, I'll leave what we should be doing before the spending to Martin um, on the on, on cost benefit analysis and, and, and optimism bias. Mm. Um, I think um, I mean I think these are really important things I mean you know uh, uh, clearly, there is a history of cost-benefit analysis of um, you know the, the business plan differing from the outcome. Um, you know there are there are uh, quite a few things we are trying to do um, to improve that. Uh, the the biggest one is the role of the uh, infrastructure projects authority and the lessons they learn from looking at these major projects. And um, we are really keen that the Infrastructure Project Authority feed those lessons back into uh, the spending view as we go. So this optimism bias doesn't just keep going round and round and round. So the obvious point, which is very clearly in our renewed green book that we published, is you know, don't, don't assume your next project is going to be any, essentially any, don't be more optimistic about your next project than you were than the outcome of your last project. Which is a fairly basic point, but um, uh, is uh, a need in there. So there's lots of things to go in there, and I think it's a it's, it's a huge challenge. Great, <laughs> right, and a very correct challenge to be prioritised in uh, what we say about the spending review as well as the spending review to force proper prioritisation. Um, I think it's the performance link that the, the before the treasury gets airborne, it should be should put out really clearly how the spending review process is going to look at performance and outcomes and money alongside each other. And that's not only a sort of systems issue, it's also a capability issue, uh, touching on, on, on the other point about uh, assurance and uh, the robustness of numbers. Great. Well, I suspect there could be much more challenge even of our report and of our, um, the Treasury's process and more comment. Um, uh, Simon, thanks very much for your passionate um, 
you know, account of what it is like to be running uh, budgets under, under these circumstances. Uh, there could be much more, but the, the process itself may be the best and most immediate test of this. Could I flag up to you two uh, bits of IFG work coming out, two big bits, uh, which are directly relevant to this. One is our annual performance tracker, which will come out in October. We bring it out before the budget, regardless of when the budget is. Um, and that uh, is by uh, Dr. Emily Andrews with Gemma Tetlow, our chief economist, uh, looking at money into public services and then the performance that comes out. And then also um, we will uh, have a, a report by Emma Norris on uh, the churn, uh, the turnover of staff throughout the civil service and just what that does to continuity. And that will be coming out later in the year. Thank you very much indeed for your questions. Thanks for coming. And thank you to the panel.